to Face to Face, and today we're going to go to China, we're going to go to New York, we're going to talk about a little bit of California. I mean, whoa, we're just visiting New York. Welcome to New York. Yeah, thanks for having me, David. And then uh, I think you brought a book here with a short collection yes. of short stories. Yes, it's called China Girl. It's my first short story collection. Just got published last year. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. So, tell me more. Well, uh, I'm a co-editor of mm -hmm. a literary journal in San Francisco okay. called Caveat Lector. Okay. And um, one of the privileges of being an editor is sometimes you get to write stories for your own publication. Mm -hmm. so That's cool. Over the years, I've accumulated quite a few. Uh -huh. uh, but about two years ago, I decided I want to try and pull together a little collection. And going through my stories, I found that some of them seem to have a common theme to them in terms of being related to Asia uh -huh. in one way or another. So I use that as the guiding principle of putting this collection together. Okay. That's how you end up with the name China Girl. China Girl, which yeah. is actually based on the David Bowie song. Exactly. That's <laughs> what I was next question. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a very good song. Um, so what, what, what was intriguing for you? Asia? What was... I think for speaking for myself as an Asian American who's born here in America, okay. um, it's always fascinated me how Asia and the West have interacted over the decades, specifically in, in terms of culture. Or not, or not interacted. Or oh, yeah. <laughs> or not, as the case may be. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I did live in China for a little while uh -huh. back in the 90s, working in Beijing. Okay. Um, which is the inspiration for several of the stories in the collection. Uh -huh. But uh, I think all the stories, whether they take place in America or they take place in Asia or some unspecified parts of Asia as well, uh -huh. um, I'm always interested as to how people interact with Western culture, even if you're in Asia, because I feel like the influence of Western culture is in Asia in very interesting ways. Um, I think. People in Asia are very conscious about the influence of Western culture, and sometimes they resist it, sometimes they partake what they like of it. And I, I always thought that tension was very interesting um, in terms of being in a certain place but also being influenced by somewhere else. So I think that runs through all the stories in the collection. But you see the Asian culture, no, because I went to Bangladesh with, with, with in Asia, but I mean, this maybe not the Asia you are talking about. And I asked, like, the Rolling Stone, no one knows the Rolling Stone. So I'm like, the influence, it's, it's quite, it, it's, it's quite, uh, I mean, they know uh, much more George because of the concert you organize and so mm -hmm. on and so forth than they were knowing uh, the Rolling Stone. So I'm... I'm yeah, I think for my particular frame of reference, yeah. which is mostly China, uh -huh. I, th I think there's, it's very interesting what they know and what they don't know about Western culture out there. When I lived there in the mid-90s, uh -huh. they were very familiar with the Beatles. Okay. They are very familiar with Bob Dylan before he went electric. Yeah. Uh, but anything that took place after the Cultural Revolution, they really had no concept of because they were cut off from the West. Also, uh, so it's, it's, everything was before, the cultural, before Mao and the Cultural Revolution, they know... That was back in the 90s, but yeah. if you go to China, these days, of yeah, course, they've yeah. completely opened themselves yeah, up to so Western now, culture. Yeah. So, so but you it's, this openness is covering everywhere in China, more or less, or it, it's uh, mainly yeah. in the big cities? I would say the cities are certainly yeah. pretty much all caught up, uh -huh. you could say. Um, countryside, I, I think it's still, obviously, in terms of both economically and culturally, they're probably a little bit behind in terms of being aware of what's out there from the West, yeah. So. So you went before the little bit the economical revolution, or at the beginning of it, no? What the 90s? Yeah, I was there in 94, 95, mostly. Yeah. So things were definitely moving full speed ahead. You know, yeah. Deng Xiaoping's reforms were taking hold. Uh -huh. it, it had been over five years since Tiananmen Square, so I think people were feeling a little bit more relaxed about opening up and taking in Western influences again, for sure. And. Uh, how do you, I mean, how do you see the influence? I mean, how do you see, do you think that, that it's, it's, it's like try to copy the West, the way it has been developed, or? <laughs> well, in China, you know, they always have a saying, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Yeah. And I tend to think 
they, they look at Western culture the same way as well, Western culture with Chinese characteristics. Uh -huh. So certainly, I think the idea of, just to give you an example, just a fast food restaurant, I think they've adopted that idea. They've certainly started up their own chains of fast food restaurants, for example. Um, in terms of other influences, you know, I think they're very careful when it comes to cinema, for example, officially. Of, of course, you can always get bootleg movies of any kind in China, mm -hmm. but in terms of official releases in cinemas, I think they're always very careful about what kind of content they want to expose to mm -hmm. the citizens over there. So mm -hmm. I, I think it really depends. Some areas are just more strict than others, I would say. But the lifestyle, I mean, it, it, you have, because it's a bit, the layers are a little bit complicated because you have a lot of people who have moved from rural to cities, with, in some ways, what happened in all over, I mean, the US and what happened in, in Europe and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you have that transition, and then on the same time, you have like the economical uh, transition of, or uh, transformation of the economical society in, as the Chinese. Um, but it's very interesting, no? I mean, how, how do you see the, the transformation? Uh, for myself, it is, it's a little disorienting. Yeah. Um, just as an example, when I lived in Beijing, I was uh -huh. working at a university, and uh -huh. outside the main gate of the university is a very nice two-lane road with a row of trees down the middle. And then you come back three years later, and, and in front of the trees. university is a six-lane highway. <laughs> so the pace of development is staggering, yeah, of no, course. It's staggering. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, it's been well documented, I think, as they're moving more towards a market economy, uh, you know, they're facing a lot of the same problems that a place like the U.S. faces in terms of a huge gap between the haves and the have-nots, and I think the Chinese government is very cognizant of that. Um, I think if you look at their recent crackdowns on corruption at local government levels, I think they're very aware that they have to have the, uh, take the moral high ground to maintain the confidence of the population, so I think you, you'll probably see a lot more of that moving forward. But, uh, you know, the, the problem of having a lot of very rich people and having a lot of very poor people, often intermixed, especially in the cities these days, I think it's a problem that's not easily solvable. It'll be interesting to see where it goes. But it's a problem for them, or it's not a problem? Because here it's not a problem. I mean, the gap, it's going at the like, speed of light. And it's, it's, I mean, just New York City is 21% of people who are below poverty level. You have 114,000 kids in New York City who are homeless. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that don't seem to be an issue for the economical, and, and people tell you it's economical crisis. It's not an economical crisis. The money is there. The distribution is bad. It's, it's the worst distribution you can imagine. But there's no discussion about distribution. There's no question, discussion about uh, uh, restructuring the economical system. So, yeah, no, well, you can't, you can't argue with the growth figures that China <laughs> has enjoyed over the past few decades, that's for but, sure. But, but, no, but they have the growth figures, but uh, they also have the discussion about how, how do we deal with the concentration of, of, of issue, because they know it's going to even go against their own goods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's certainly, I think it's a different problem than what we see here in the States, what they're facing. Um, you know, even though they've seen such remarkable progress over the past few decades, I think, I think they're very much aware that there are a lot of people still in the countryside yeah, who are yeah. living on subsistence level. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you have phenomena like people coming into the cities to work in factories, you know, the whole factory girl phenomenon, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, it, so in a way, it's the same as what we face, in a way, it's different. I'll be, I'll be interesting to see how it goes. But the speed of transformation, the speed how China responds to, to conflict, to situation, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, uh, I don't think we, uh, the, we are, uh, on the West, we respond that fast to, to conflict and to situation. Yeah, the government uh, certainly has more of a free hand <laughs> to step in over there, yeah. which has its good side and its bad yeah. side. Yeah, that's true. Come back to the book. What 
what uh, so wide short story why not long ones you, you don't <laughs> yeah, you prefer to write in 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 short uh, uh, stories it's easier for you or it's more adapted to what people read or um, well to be honest um, I would like to write novels okay <laughs> I'm working on novels okay. <laughs> but short stories you know that it, it's a it's more compact uh -huh. form of uh, literature that, you know I wouldn't say it's easier to write, but certainly it's easier to accumulate. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, for this book, I feel like I kind of broke the rules in a way because they often say, first book, you should be a novel, make your grand statement with your first book. Uh -huh. And for this, I, th I thought I'd just do something a little bit more playful. Uh -huh. um, the stories in this book, you know, they sort of cover a wide variety of subjects and moods. And uh, I play around with form a lot in terms of my writing. Uh -huh. So I thought something a little bit more experimental and fun as a first statement would be nice. And so, so you, you, you're looking to, to publish a, a fiction anytime soon, or you're working on it, or longer stories, or how it? I actually have a few projects yeah. I'm working on. I'm working on a novel right now mm -hmm. uh, set in Shanghai, contemporary Shanghai. Mm -hmm. So um, I still have to do some more research for that, so I'll be going to China next year for that. Oh, okay. That's a good excuse. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I have to go to China too. I don't know how much of a tax write-off I can get for it, but... Uh, but oh, if you... Tax is not an issue. You can always <laughs> find a way to... <laughs> the other project I'm working on is my mom passed away recently, oh, and um, she was a writer herself. Okay. And uh, she kept all these travelogues she wrote from her visits to China from the late 70s up until her death a few years ago. And this was when China was opening itself up back to the West. So on the one hand, they're fascinating travelogues as you see China develop through the years, but it's also a very personal story because it's her reuniting with family and friends wow. she hasn't seen for three decades. Wow. So I'm trying to edit that and hopefully maybe find oh, a home for it. that's unbelievable. Yeah. So when did she come to the U.S.? She came at the young girl? Yeah. Or? Well, she was born in China, but her family immigrated to Taiwan in 1949 when okay. the communists took power. Okay. And she grew up in Taiwan. She came to the U.S. for a graduate school, and she basically stayed ever since. Oh, wow. Yeah. And also, so, but she also has the story about what's happening to her in the U.S., because it was very complicated for the Chinese in the U.S. for some oh, time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. She went to Michigan University uh -huh. for a graduate degree, and uh, she didn't she have may, a lot of money. She may be the first one to go to... Uh, the first Chinese to be uh, to go to the university. No? <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. This was in the early '60s yeah, yeah. when she went. Uh -huh. But yeah, she actually wrote a book about her experiences growing up in China, oh, wow. Taiwan, she was already and the U.S. Yeah. yeah, so she wrote a book back in 1988 okay. about. No, because in New York City, you had, the Chinese was not able to own properties until not too long ago. I mean, the beginning of uh, uh, I think it's '30s or '40s, they were not. So they had to buy it through a conduit. Somebody else were buying them the property, and then. Yeah, fortunately, my parents were uh, lucky enough to come after that. Yeah, <laughs> they both came here in the '60s. Yeah, so they didn't have to face and. So how do how are you gonna do work on this uh, on this your mother's story? How do you? Well, it's a lot of pages. Yeah. <laughs> it's over 400 pages of work. Uh -huh. Um, and it's not just China, it's also other travels through Asia. So um, I'm really just trying to give it a little bit of a shape, a little bit of form. I mean, uh, the narrative is pretty straightforward, actually, in terms of just following her travels in chronological order, because you get to see the modern China develop through her eyes. And also, as she gets to meet some of her long-lost relatives and friends, uh, those are more like vignettes and little stories. Uh -huh. So it's, it's just a matter of just trying to get in a good rhythm and polish it up, and hopefully um, the publisher will be interested. Yeah, that's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. And then, and then those are books, sorry? It was on the, the other, you said you have an, you're working on two? Oh, yes. <laughs> so the other book I'm working on is a contemporary story, but it's loosely based on the old Chinese tradition, which I think for the most part is not practiced anymore, where if a rich family had a son who died, before he got married, they would find a local girl and marry her to the corpse. In other words, they wanted someone to accompany the groom into the afterlife. He, they didn't want the groom to be all alone in the afterlife, so they would hire these women to become the wives of these dead sons, 
live with the family, get all the privileges of being in that family, but the catch is, of course, that she's married to a dead person. They call and the, it's for the rest of their life? The rest of their lives, yes. It's, so it's a phenomenon called ghost brides. Oh, wow. And what happened to these people, to this woman? Oh, very often they would just live out the rest of their lives with these rich families. You know, they wouldn't be able to have a real husband, <laughs> but they would get all the privileges of being in that family and being married to the dead son of the family. And how, do, I mean, it's, it's a game or it's, it's, it's like for people, it's, 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 so it's a mix of two space? It's how, a, does, how does it work? How does a, it's, it's, a, it's a superstition in that yeah. the family, the idea, of course, is that when the woman finally dies, she'll be able to accompany her already dead husband into the afterlife. So, but yeah, it's, it's just like having a member of the family. You know, she's, she'd be treated like a member of the family. No, no, I understand for I understand for the for the woman. What I'm trying to see the logic for the parents. Uh, how does it play for them? Uh, yeah, it's the belief that it, they don't want their son to be alone in the afterlife. So they figure that if they can marry him to a woman, even if the son is already dead, but once the woman has passed, she will join their so son. So it's a union for. Life and afterlife. Yes. When you when you get married, it's for it's forever. Mainly for the afterlife. Yes. It's mainly for the afterlife. In <laughs> I China, mean, when you get married, it's, it's oh no, I'm not a regular marriage. No? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just talking so, about the guest bride. No, no, but that's, that's what I'm trying to see. It's like when when people get married in China, it's 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 uh, I think has a that transcendental <laughs> dimension. I, I think they're probably more pro pragmatic about it these days. This, uh -huh. We're talking about a tradition that was like centuries ago. Yeah. And you think that's gone? Is it still practicing now? And you think it's it's still happening? Uh, you know, I, I can't say for sure. Although I do have a line in my book, one of my characters says that if you've heard about something happening in China, it's probably happening. Yeah, it's still happening <laughs> yeah. today. Yeah. So, but I, I use that tradition as sort of a jumping-off point for this story that I'm working on for okay. my novel. All right. So, any any things you want to plug or any uh, before we we close? No, I just uh, just might say if anybody wants to keep up with my writings and where uh -huh. I'm going, uh, my website is holinauthor.com. Okay. And they can find any information they any want information. about me there. Right. Yeah. So, thank you so much for coming to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, David. You're welcome. Yeah. It's my pleasure. That was Face to Face. Uh, thank you uh, very much for watching. And please keep uh, uh, reading your news on presenza.com. And hope to see you very soon.